Thank you very much. If most of you weren't being paid, I'd be flattered by that. <laughs> <laughs> this has been a very sad few days in the history of New York. And for me, it's been sadder. My heart goes out to Elliot Spitzer, his wife, Silda, his three daughters, his parents. I know them all. They're friends of mine. Uh, last summer, his parents actually had my wife, Michelle, and I up to lunch one day. And we were, used to call them our other family, probably because we've gotten kind of tired of our own family. <laughs> but in all seriousness, it's a uh, very difficult time for them. They're in my prayers. I did not get to this position in the way that most people have in the way that most people would want. But I made a commitment when I gave my word to Governor Spitzer in January 2006, when I left as the Democratic Senate leader to be his running mate, that I would be prepared if in event I had to assume authority. I am prepared, and on Monday at 1 p.m., I will have the oath of office administered to me in the assembly chamber. Most of you are invited. And uh, we will, at this point, it is time to get back to the business of the state. I promised the governor yesterday that I would commit myself to the people of this great state, that we would have stability and continuity in those challenges that lie ahead. Now we have to get New York back on track. I have met with the Speaker of the Assembly. I will be meeting later with the Majority Leader of the Senate. I met yesterday with the Controller, and I will meet tomorrow with the Attorney General of the State of New York. I will meet with agency heads, with commissioners, with the Budget Director, and with legislators. We will all commit ourselves in a bipartisan way to building a relationship that will restore the public trust in our government. Let me be very clear about this. There may be a five-day transition period, but we are hard at work at this moment putting together a budget that will help New York to thrive. This weekend, I will have high-end executive officials in my office hammering out the details of this budget. We cannot afford to waste another second. We have a budget that's due and a deadline to meet. We share this responsibility with the legislature, and I look forward to working with all of them. If you have any questions, I will answer them at this time. Hi, yes, Governor. This is John Mahoney from the Daily News. Uh, regarding the policies of your predecessor, uh, can you tell us whether or not you're going to adopt his view on, 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 on uh, congestion pricing? And on his law reform agenda, including campaign yeah. finance reform, and then do you have any concern about the release of violent killings on on uh, parole as we've identified uh, with an uptick in the rate of, of those being released from prison on parole? Oh, the first part. <laughs> Oh, sure, that was congestion pricing. Uh, on congestion pricing, we're taking a look at it. On violent killers, we're taking a look at it. Uh, actually, I, I do have a serious concern on that issue, Joe, that, that uh, uh, the newspaper raised. And on the issue of campaign finance, it was something that I fought for as uh, a member of the Senate minority in our reform agenda that goes back into the 90s, and we want to uh, not dictate campaign finance. Um, we want to really persuade legislators that it really is the root of a lot of the dysfunction that we have in Albany. In other words, the overfinancing of campaigns. Obviously, there has to be fundraising. It's, uh, it's a necessary function, but we'd like to come to some consensus with the two legislators' bodies about curtailing it to a degree. Yeah, but on the congestion pricing, you said you're going to take a look at it. The governor, uh, before you said he was for it, did you say if you're going to, to go for the, the total part of it that has been so controversial? 
Well, it's so comprehensive and it has evolved and changed and mutated at different points. And at this point, this is the reason I'm going to be here this weekend. Actually, it's the reason that I put my inauguration back, my swearing in. This was not the governor. This was my idea. I wanted not to spend today uh, being sworn in or speaking or in any way celebrating. I wanted to come in here, meet with the legislative leaders, get back to work on some of those points where I need to be updated as to where the budget process is right now, do that for a few days, and then I'd like to be sworn in in the assembly chamber at one o'clock on Monday with the Senate and the assembly present, with the judges of the Court of Appeals, bringing the whole government together because that is the only way we're going to have progress. I guess I'll do a two-part event. <laughs> one is um, on the budget, which is obviously due by April 1st. Are there any changes that you plan even before the negotiation to make to Governor Spitzer's plan? And two, along the same lines of uh, the Governor the, uh, Governor Spitzer's uh, campaign uh, uh, promise to limit the money he personally takes in to $10,000, are you still going to uh, limit yourself to that amount? Ken, on the first part, this is a budget negotiation. So I don't want the inference to be drawn that if I make any change, that it implies some disagreement with Governor Spitzer because he was negotiating with the legislature. So at some point, the uh, forecasts and some of the uh, uh, revenue projections and the spending are different among the three different players in this budget process. What I'm saying is that one of the reasons we're negotiating is the understanding that we are all likely to change. But I would not like that to be implied as an, an inherent disagreement with uh, Governor Spitzer, but perhaps an evolution of a philosophy that we shared when we decided to run together. On the second point, there are issues related to campaign spending that I think need to be addressed. For instance, there are a lot more expenditures in which the campaigns are asked to, uh, to pledge money. For instance, uh, flying in the helicopter, extra people flying in the helicopter uh, on occasion that the state used to pick up, but now the campaign finances pick up. And I think that has to be factored into the whole idea of how much money each candidate should be allowed to raise. Tom, uh, Uh, I generally think that I have about the same general point of view. I certainly, having been a legislator for a period of time and having been a legislative leader, have recognized, as I think we all do, it's a great thing about government, that some of your colleagues who you were bitterly in opposition to ideologically, you realize that it might not be your way, but it is an acceptable way. Um, but I don't know that uh, my ideas, that there are some uh, points of view, I guess, that, you know, I, I've changed over the years, but I'm pretty much the same person. Certainly, Governor Spitzer made a promise to the public, a promise that uh, we both believed in, that we don't want to raise the personal income taxes. Um, we are looking at a recession, and I think uh, a stock market that's in flux, uh, our major investment houses under siege, our banks, uh, in a sense, borrowing from other countries. We have a huge economic problem in this country. And I don't necessarily know when that might become an issue, but I'm hoping that it won't be in the near future. Scott. Mr. Patterson, Scott Brown from WGRC in Buffalo. As you know, Governor Spitzer had a uh, strong 
commitment to Buffalo and Western New York to the waterfront or the University of Buffalo. What can you tell the people of Western New York about your commitment and what will follow suit with the, the former governor's desire? Well, the former governor uh, who will uh, leave office, the governor who will leave office on Monday, uh, probably lived about 30 blocks from me, meaning that we both lived a long way from Buffalo. And I know that when he was a candidate, he was asked many times, how could a New York City resident care about upstate? But I think the billion dollar infusion, actually holding a second uh, message to the uh, residents of New York, a state of the state that was actually given in Buffalo on January 16th, I think he made it real clear. And I made a point to be standing right there when he made it because I feel exactly the same way. Well, the stylistic difference is just that we're two different human beings. We are individuals. Um, I think we share a lot of the same points of view. Uh, and I can't tell you much more than that. We always got along very well. So, you know, different styles can make for a, a good relationship and always did between uh, the governor in his first year and his eight years as an uh, attorney general, which I thought he performed highly admirably. Governor Evans, Axel Bank, and WRC in Rochester, are you committed to the Midtown Project? And will you see make sure that Rochester gets the money needs for that project to be I was very pleased with the Midtown Project when it was first announced. Um, I would hope that we wouldn't have any obstacles to, to making it happen. On the property tax cap, uh, the governor and I felt that this was a good idea. We appointed County Executive Swazi to oversee a commission that will look at how to do it. I'm very interested in, in that report because the question wasn't whether or not there was a will, the question was whether or not there was a way. When that commission reports back, I have to make the determination if that way fits with uh, the apparatus that we have and our ability to implement it. On the second question, on February the 5th, the governor gave a uh, six-week delay in his decision on Broadwater. Um, I do not know what his decision would have been. I might actually ask for a little more time since it's uh, coming to that point and uh, really haven't been able to look at it enough to render a point of view to at this time. that we have an economy upstate that caused 191,000 adults to lose their jobs since the turn of the century. That we have an educational system downstate that has failed many children in New York City. That we have uh, a subprime mortgage crisis that's attacking those who own homes all over this state. I want to pass this budget in a way that is commensurate with the tremendous economic hardships that our budget uh, has in, uh, experienced, but at the same time recognize uh, that there are people out there with families and there are people out there with needs and to try to balance all of that uh, would be my priority and would try to put all my energy into it. Governor Berkeley Green from NBC in Rochester, other than resigning from office and the embarrassment associated with that, do you think Governor Spitzer should face any more punishment? Should he face criminal charges? Well, I think that what happens in these situations is that we have to leave it to the prosecutors. As I said before, I mean, I'm a very dear friend of Governor Spitzer. I know what he's gone through this, this week. 
you know, in my heart, I, I think he's suffered enough. There are probably people who don't know him that well, who just look at government, they feel very disappointed, very dispirited and confused, probably think that uh, whatever punishment he might get wouldn't be enough. This is why we have dispassionate law enforcement that looks into these situations, decides on what the charges will be, renders a decision, and as citizens, we should leave it in their hands and support them, which I do. I think that uh, given what's happening in, in the economy, it's going to be very difficult to move on any type of uh, enhancement at, at this particular time. Um, obviously, legislative salaries are connected with judges, and most of your affiliates have weighed in on the need to uh, find a way to raise their salaries because we're trying to get our best and brightest to stay behind the bench. Uh, but knowing that their salaries sometimes aren't even up to that of first-year associates in major law firms. And uh, so those would be my goals, and to try to separate them would be a desire. It has not worked to this point, and uh, I'll just try to work with it. In some ways, I feel that I'm sitting on a sand castle that other people built. There are so many African Americans, both men and women, who throughout the past couple of centuries have struggled unremittingly to try to advance opportunity for all people and for themselves. I think they would have been far more qualified than me to serve in this position. And the fact that it has taken this long in some ways is a sad note. But if it in any way allows for African Americans or those who are disabled, 71% of the blind are unemployed, 90% of deaf people in this country are unemployed, maybe one of them could figure out a cure for cancer, but we can't get them into the workplace. Uh, the educational proficiency of the disabled surpasses the national education uh, average, and yet we have these horrible unemployment rates in those communities. So to whatever extent my presence impresses upon employers or impresses upon younger people who are like me in either way, or Hispanics or women, we've never had a governor from either of those uh, uh, communities, then I would feel very privileged, very proud, and very flattered to be in this position. Last question. Just so we don't have to go through this whole resignation ordeal again, given the shock of the past week, I think it's fair to ask, have you ever patronized a prostitute as a public while I was serving as a public position? Only the lobbyists. <laughs> That's why we want campaign finance, Jacob. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Lee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It is um, a daunting challenge. Uh, I've had many of them. And I'm pretty excited about trying to fulfill what is expected of me. That's always a high expectation, and it's fun in the one life that we all have to try to go beyond perhaps even where you may have thought you ever went. Could go. Thank you. Thank you.